Hello, everyone. This is Sean from the Soccer Nostalgia blog. I have the pleasure to interview Iranian author, interpreter, translator, and football historian, Mr. Jamshid Furughi. Mr. Furughi has appeared before on the podcast discussing Iran during the 1978 World Cup. This is an interview that's separate from a podcast series. This video interview will serve as a companion piece to a written blog presentation on the origins of Iran's Perse Police Taj rivalry. Hello, Jamshid. Always a pleasure. Hello, Sean. Uh, very nice to be on your program again. Thank you. Before we discuss the birth of this historic rivalry, can you describe football in Iran in the 1960s, mostly in the capital in Tehran? Absolutely. Basically, the 1960s, from a footballing uh, perspective, mirrored what was happening in Iranian society uh, with respect to social and political upheavals. We can even go to the uh, fact that we had a prime minister in the mid-60s, Hassan Ali Mansu, who actually was one of the first players who ever turned out for Gushak Savaran, as the club was known uh, Later, later known as Taj, and then currently uh, referred to as Esteglal. And the 60s really were a period of blossoming for Iranian football domestically. Matches were much more intensely followed. The fan base really, I think, took off in the 1960s. And everything was pretty much focused on clubs that were based and situated in and around the capital, Tehran. So it was limited in geographic scope from a competitive perspective, but clubs were beginning to be formed in the provinces as well. And the attraction the sport garnered from everyday Iranians, primarily male at the time, of course, really, really began spreading like wildfire in the 60s. So I think the 60s are really a pivotal decade when you look back from a historical perspective and everything seemed to intensify before really moving on to a phase where the sport, the organization, the structure, the finances became more stable and organized in the 70s. Let's start off by looking at the historical club Shaheen. Can you talk about the founder of this club, Dr. Abbas Ekrami? Of course. Uh, Abbas Ekrami, like many other figures who ended up being instrumental in the advent of sporting clubs in general, was a well-educated young man. He actually founded the club. Uh, in uh, his early 20s. I would say he was 22 or 23 years old, meaning he had just finished uh, his university studies. And let's keep in mind, the early 1940s is a period where when a lot of Iranians are finding their way into the halls of higher education. So we're seeing not necessarily an initial wave, but a secondary wave of... Uh, young men and women who are aspiring to attain college degrees in Iran as well as abroad. So we're seeing for the first time the fruits of that movement, which was started in the 1930s primarily during Reza Shah's time. And in fact, the first university, Tehran University, was founded, uh, founded in 1935, as it happens to be by my grandfather, uh, who was prime minister at the time. So we are seeing a lot of young Iranians who are finishing their college studies who then decide to partake in either founding or becoming part of sporting clubs. And Dr. Ekrami is probably the best example of what we've just uh, been discussing because he really took to his task in, in a real serious and dedicated way. He went to England, was exposed to how football was played and organized and managed in England. Uh, we know that he uh, met with, uh, at the time, Stanley Rouse, later to be Sir Stanley Rouse, and was exposed to 
the um, profession of refereeing. He received his refereeing uh, certificates, I believe, even up to the international level. And perhaps he may be looked upon as the first Iranian who really brought back a professional perspective. And I don't mean professional from a financial standpoint, but from a serious application of football organization and management to Iran and started the club. Um, the club was named Shaheen. Shaheen in Farsi literally means hawk. Some people mistake that with Falcon. Falcon is Shahbaz, and I think we'll speak to that name later. And actually named his firstborn, who happened to be a son, Shaheen as well. So he started with that foundation. The creed was very much based on something parallel to the Corinthians creed that developed in England in the late 19th century in English football, where you had a amateur approach in the sense that you engaged in sporting activity for the betterment of your character, for building character, for building values, solid foundational values. And the sporting side was almost secondary. The whole idea was that a healthy mind can only develop in a healthy body. So these were all relatively new concepts to Iranian society at large. And Dr. Ikrami, as we can now look back, really had a huge impact, I believe, on how Iranian society uh, amongst the youth uh, developed in the 1940s. Can you describe the status and origins of Shaheen in these days and its rise to prominence? So effectively, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Ekrami's vision, and it's very impressive, I think, that he, he really had this vision at such a young age, transformed very quickly into an opportunity for young Iranians, those who had an emphasis and focus on education, uh, let's keep in mind, he, Dr. Ekrami actually received a lot of input and support from his mentor, who was a teacher in the Darband uh, neighborhood in uh, northern Tehran. This particular teacher focused on helping young students who had not been able to pass their uh, year-end exams at whatever level of school they were, and he would attract them to his academy, for lack of a better term, and spend the summer uh, with them at, to prepare them for examinations to matriculate so they wouldn't have to repeat the same class again. And so really the emphasis, the whole perspective was education. And so he attracted, Dr. Karami's club basically, attracted young, educated, or young people who were drawn to and believed in education as an important pillar of their development. And within a couple of years, the club had grown in membership to the point where they had youth teams and um, a different level age group teams. And for the first few years, it was just Dr. Ekrami. I mean, he, he obviously had support from other people, but he was pretty much 24 seven focused and dedicated to the club. And over time, the club really became, just like he named his son, Shaheen, his child. And for 25 years, effectively, his presence in one form or the other really defined the spirit of the club, the manner that it was managed was so professional that sporting success quickly followed. And keeping in mind that during those early years, there were only four or five, six notable uh, sporting clubs that participated in football. The rivalries that we are discussing now hadn't really developed yet. So these were nascent years. These were years of formation, development, but most importantly, an era where the identity of each club began to form and the reputation that that identity then brought about helped create that intense rivalry that flourished in the late 60s and through the 70s and now up to today. So let's discuss the origins of Taj. Going back to the same theme, 
Taj was also well. Let's 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 go back to the very first uh, moments of uh, when the when the club was formed. It was formed as uh, you know uh, under the name Duchache Saboran. So it was a group of young people again in their early twenties who, under the leadership at that time of a military officer by the name of Parviz Khosravani, gathered together. They all had a common interest in riding bicycles. They were bicyclists, cyclists. And they formed their club initially with cycling, volleyball, uh, and a couple of other sports in mind. Football wasn't actually on the list of uh, the initial sports that the club engaged in. But soon after football, because of the popularity that it was gaining, uh, became part of the sporting tradition of Ochaq Sabaron. And three years later, this was, I believe, in 1945 slash 46, in 1949 slash 50, the name actually changed to Taj. Khosravani decided that because, to some extent, he would need to have the blessings of the royal family or the royal personage to name the club Taj. And because he was a a military officer and, and very much committed to defending the monarchy, the selection of the name was no coincidence. So he actually was able to get the attention of royal courtiers and people co close to the young Shah at the time. I think the Shah was back then in his late 20s and asked for permission. And officially, the permission was granted in writing uh, for the use of the name so that it wouldn't conflict or it would become clear that royal patronage had officially been given. The name turned to Taj. And this, I think, also provides uh, the seedling of the rivalry that was forthcoming because Dr. Ekrami's vision involved building a club from the grassroots, leaning on the pillars of education, uh, personality, character development, etc., and attracted young people from all walks of life where Doshakra Savaran, as it became Taj, the membership was mostly not confined but and not restricted, but mostly involved uh, young men in the military or young men who had more of a sporting interest. And once the name was changed to Taj, naturally pro-monarchy minded young men found their way there. And again, not in any kind of conspiratorial manner, but just in an evolutionary uh, manner. So really that's when I think we start seeing the dividing line become clear or clearer. Uh, it starts in the early 1950s. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the 1960s, everything intensifies as does the rivalry. Is this why... Taj had traditionally the support of the military class after the name change? Well, I would say that, you know, most of the founding members uh, and the group surrounding uh, Padvis Khosrovani were, were military educated, uh, military academy, or young men who uh, had finished college and had joined the military. It was almost Sparta versus Athens in that sense. Uh, you got the feeling. I wasn't, of course, born yet, but by the time I became involved as a fan, as an active participant in the football um, culture of Iran, it was clear you could almost run into somebody at a, a family gathering or at a social event and pretty much predict which side they were on based upon what they did for a living, their political views, their place in society. And not always, obviously, uh, it was not always predictable, but by the mid to late 60s, it had become pretty, pretty clear. The divide had become pretty clear. At what point did Shaheen become the rivals, the main rivals of Taj? And how was this rivalry in his early years? So when we look at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it, the clubs were all effectively based in or in the metropolitan area of Tehran, although Tehran was actually a very small city in the 1950s. I believe the population was somewhere between 450,000 to 600,000. Obviously, it grew rapidly in the decade of the 50s and even more rapidly in the 60s and 70s. But the club, Tehran Club Championship, 
even though it was nece not necessarily formalized under that name, it was effectively a Tehran Club Championship. The first year, I believe, was in 1944 or 45, actually 45 slash 46, because the war, World War II had ended. And I know that during the uh, period of the war, no football was played in Iran in any formal capacity. In fact, the national team played their first official, unofficial match against Afghanistan in Kabul uh, two days before the Allies invaded Iran in 1941, uh, late August, and didn't play again until after the war. And uh, so we had a period of about five years where football was not really a major consideration or even a minor consideration because there were more important things going on. So in that very first year, a club named Sarabaz, which translates into soldier, won the Tehran Club Championship. Uh, Darai, which was the club of the Ministry of Finance, uh, was the next champion. By then, of course, we're now uh, in the first year where Dochakha Savanan has become Taj. Taj wins the third year. Shaheen wins the fourth year. And then pretty much for the next 10 years or so, it's between mostly Taj, a couple of Darais and uh, Shoah and a club called Nadir thrown in, in, in the mix. So Taj really dominates the 1950s from a Tehran club championship perspective. But again, going back to Dr. Ekrami's philosophy, the results on the pitch were secondary to the motto of the club, which was, again, a healthy mind develops in a healthy body. And character is more important than actual on, on, on the pitch results. So that rivalry that we were speaking about didn't really exist per se in a sporting manner in the 50s. And then in the 60s, it starts becoming much more of a rivalry because Shaheen actually starts attracting more and more top quality players who follow the creed. And uh, in the 60s, I think we see the rivalry really blossom at first in a peaceful manner, very competitive, but without any significant political or social or cultural undertones. But it's the second half of the 60s. I think we have to go back to the 1963-64 period where demonstrations in Iran had uh, taken a violent turn. And it was during that time that actually the Tehran Club Championship was suspended for almost a year and a half. And it didn't resume again until things had calmed down. And it was after uh, football resumed again, once things had stabilized, that we really see uh, Shaheen, Taj, Dorai, and No Jabonan really uh, become, and Pos, become the five real prominent club teams that were always competing for the title. Now, getting back to the 1950s, I read there were some troubles between the clubs during the the Hasvik of the Knockout Cup competition. Apparently, after one of the matches, there were fights outside of the stadium between the rival fans. Was this considered maybe a reference point? Or like you said, it was more in the 60s when it too, fully took shape? I, I don't really see the 50s as being... I mean, okay, we have to go back to what was happening in Iran in the 50s as well. So there were periods of upheaval. We had the 1950 to 53 period where there was a clash of heads between constitutionalists and, and anti-monarchists. There were three years, I believe, in the 1950s where the league was suspended, not because of violence, but because it really hadn't been structured in a manner that was what I would consider professional. We have to look back at uh, Iranian football history and, and realize that even today, despite the fact that everything is so automated and everything is computerized, facts and figures and data, uh, statistics are all now so well maintained. Iran really was very poor at structuring organizations uh, from a sporting standpoint. We had individual athletes who were wonderful. We had a lot of uh, sporting heroes and icons. But from an organizational standpoint, we were always lacking. I remember in the 1970s, team sheets were still 
written by hand and handed out. And so when you go to the Iranian Football Federation archives, there are many international matches, official matches. You can't be sure who was subbed in, who actually started. Uh, some of the handwriting is pretty bad, so you 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 can't be sure which player actually was on the pitch, or which player appeared, who won how many caps, which matches were official. And that actually leads to the whole later press police uh, Taj rivalry, where the first couple of matches are considered friendlies. They're not played in any specific formal official competition. So what are they really? Are they important? Are they considered as part of the uh, Derby history, et cetera? So these types of things happen a lot, but in the 50s especially, and then the 40s and 50s, the Iranian Football Federation was woeful in terms of record keeping. And in terms of management and administrative affairs, uh, they were novices. And it wasn't because they weren't capable people, but it was because I think it was something new to them. And Football didn't have the gravitas in Iran at the time that it had developed almost half a century, if not more, earlier in Europe and South America. So the 50s, I think, were more haphazard in terms of football club rivalries and incidents that took place oftentimes were as a result of a flashpoint in a match. We have to admit Iranians are somewhat uh, prone to... <laughs> having uh, easily inflamed emotions in general. And I think the football pitch was no, uh, no exception. Uh, we have so many instances of incidents that took place between players, gentlemen, gentlemanly players. I mean, I think uh, as a football culture, Iran has always been sporting in its uh, approach, but, you know, things happen. And I think the fans involved would take it to the next level during or after a match. So I don't think it was anything uh, sinister, anything politically motivated necessarily. But I think in the 60s, that started becoming a, a major part of what was happening on the pitch and off the pitch. At this point, I guess we're going to the 50s into the 60s. Who are the prominent players and managers of Shaheen? So Shaheen ends up being a haven for some of the top, top players in Iranian football. Uh, these are players who go on to represent the national team. And in the 60s, the national team starts becoming a force, organized, uh, well-managed, well-coached, and prominent in terms of being able to express their potential. So you have players, some some of the greats, we have to go back to, for example, Amir Masoud Burman, who was a national team captain in the late 50s, uh, we have, actually, I think it's very interesting to, to note that among the players who are attracted to Shaheen, and that's not to say that the players attracted to Shaheen were better educated or more educated necessarily than the players who were attracted to Taj, I think it was a selection matter. So Dr. Ekrami is still a major force, the driving force of the club, and he is very much insistent on making sure that the players who are representing the club at the highest level, meaning the first team, represent the philosophy and the motto of the club. And so I don't want the listeners to think that the players who are, I'm about to name as you know star, uh, examples of stars of that period, late 50s, early 60s, mid 60s, were in any way necessarily better characters or more educated characters, as I mentioned earlier, but they were for lack of a better term, almost handpicked by the club management. We have to also mention Abdullah Khajanuri, who was president uh, and managing director, effectively, of the club in the 60s. He himself was also very well known as a um, educator, someone with refined personality, a kind person, a gentlemanly person. So Shaheen is now uh, developing a reputation for players coming to the club such as, say, Hamid Shirzadegan. Hamid Shirzadegan, probably the second or maybe third chronologically superstar of Iranian football, educated in the United States, played, obviously, at the highest level in colleges when he was uh, in the U.S., also ended up playing a year or two for the indoor Baltimore team. I think it was called the Baltimore Blast at the time in the mid-late 60s. But he comes to Shaheen, 
he has a focus on education. He's very well educated, especially for someone who at the time is playing uh, at the highest level of football in, in the country. And then you have Humayun Besadi, you have uh, Hussein Kalani, you have Mehrab Sharukhi, you have Jafar Akashani, who actually I knew very well uh, personally. These are all players who, we do have a couple of exceptions. I'm going to mention Ibrahim Oshtiani and, and uh, Aziz Asli, the goalkeeper slash captain for so many years. Uh, these are players who really were all gentlemen, uh, just from a sporting standpoint and from a personal uh, perspective. Perhaps the most prominent, I would say, was Parviz Dehtari, who for many years was the captain of the national team. An icon, really. Uh, there's no one on any side of the divide who would ever dispute that uh, Dehtari was one of the best we've ever produced in terms of a fine example of a human being, as well as a great footballer. And when I mention Shirz Adegan as maybe the second or third superstar, it's a question of, do you put him chronologically ahead or behind or at the same time as Dehtari? Urumand, probably being uh, the first, along with Jedi Kaur, Buki Jedi Kaur, who played for Taj. So you have a, a host of players who are also uh, developing a reputation as being civic-minded and socially uh, alert and involved. Uh, there's an incident in, in 1964 where six uh, Chinese players refused to travel with the national team to a tour of the Soviet Union. The tour actually involved a, a national team playing several matches against Soviet clubs, so they're not considered full internationals. But this was prior to the uh, 1964 Rome Olympics. And the reason was that the Federation had not selected, for disciplinary reasons, a couple of their colleagues. And, of course, this uh, raised the ire of the Federation. The Federation thought of this as treasonous. In fact, the six players were all suspended and missed out on the 1964 Olympics, which weakened the Iranian team severely. And this was, I think, one of the first incidents where you can look back and say, you know what, you've got six players who are taking a stand. The stand is one that's not popular with the Federation. The Federation obviously is an arm of the physical education organization of Iran. Uh, at the time, a cabinet, not a cabinet position, but soon to be a cabinet position. So you're effectively taking a stand against the government. And their punishment was severe. As I mentioned, they missed out on the Olympics. And so now all of a sudden you have a lot of people who see this as a, a grave injustice. It weakens the national team. The players are punished too severely uh, for, being able, for, for speaking out on behalf of two of their players. And I think that's when you start seeing the rift. Not coincidentally, this is soon after the 1963 upheavals. That's really when I think the fire is lit underneath the clubs in terms of where they stand and how they start becoming identified as pro or anti-government clubs, correctly or incorrectly. Can you discuss the reasons Shaheen was disbanded in the summer of 1967? Well, yes. I mean, there's now quite a bit of information regarding what happened. Uh, the information really comes from a series of letters that were required reading, really, for anybody who is interested in and follows and is passionate about Iranian football history. So Parviz Khosavani is now in exile. This is 1999. Uh, he's living in London. And he reaches out to Abdullah Khajanuri who I mentioned earlier was at the time president managing director of Shaheen, uh, in a letter, very kind letter. And Fajanuri takes advantage of the opportunity and in his response basically writes a multi-page diatribe, effectively, very politely, very well written, uh, as you would expect from a gentleman like Fajanuri, where he basically reveals for the first time what happened. So we take Fajanuri's version I think as fact, because number one, he was well known as a uh, honorable person, so there's no reason why he would lie or embellish. Kostravoni never responded, which in my view is acquiescence, uh, uh, silence. Uh, in this case, is reflective of the fact that he either concurred with or didn't want to continue the, the uh, debate because Khajanuri had made such an emphatic case. And so the story pretty much is that um, 
Well, before I go into the details of the story, we have to remember in 19, I'm sorry, in 1342, the inaugural match of the season, the Tehran Club Championship, features Dara Ian Shaheen. In a rare appearance, the Shah is in the stadium, Amjadiye. So this would be 1962 63. I'm not sure of the Gregorian calendar date, but I would say probably early 63, maybe late 1962. And the stadium is jam-packed, of course, as always. And their fans are primarily Shaheen fans because they had, honestly, the largest fan base at the time. They had already developed into the most popular club in Tehran in terms of numbers of fans. And the fans are singing on one side of the stadium, Shaw, which is ironic, right? Because the Shah's there. And the response from the other side of the stadium is Keen. So instead of really doing what maybe the Shah would have enjoyed hearing and loudly proclaiming the name of the Shah, they're actually showing their support for the club. But by bifurcating the name into the two syllables, they're effectively saying Shaw and then Hink, which can be translated and denoted to mean animal. And so that's taken as an insult by many. We can, the Shah never actually ever, ever referenced this incident, so we don't know if he was actually personally insulted or took it as an insult. And that really was another flashpoint, I think, that set the stage for what eventually happened in 1967. So now Shaheen is playing Tehran Javon. Tehran Javon is one of the four or five competing clubs. They have a chance at the title, but an outside chance. But they need to win to at least give Dorai a chance to win the title. And it was known at the time that Dorai and Tehran Javon had supporters high up in the government or the sporting organizations in Iran. So the match starts. Ibrahim Oshtiani is red carded early on, I think maybe in the 10th or 12th, the 10th, 11th, 12th minute for a first offense. Of course, Oshtiani was known as a rather rabid and no nonsense, tough tackling player who liked to get on uh, his opponents' nerves by calling them less than uh, kind names, but that's all part of the, the competitive spirit. So he's uh, red carded for what's considered a first offense. And Shaheen is down to 10 men. Soon after, Tehran Javon scores a goal. And the fan base is just completely silenced. So all you can hear are the uh, Tehran Javon supporters who are in the minority. And in the stands, as you would expect, is the president of the federation, Hussein Surudi who had a military background. He was actually one of the first players who ever played for the Iranian national team, but also played basketball at a high level. He was uh, part of the Iranian uh, 1948 Olympic basketball team in London. Had a good reputation. I always thought he was a, a good man, but um, apparently based on what we now know about these incidents of that day, uh, he wasn't happy uh, with the fact that uh, Shaheen was so popular amongst the people. And his favorite team, which some say was Dorai, was in a desperate need for Shaheen to start sputtering at the end of the season so that they would have a chance to win. And when the match is 1-0 in favor of uh, Tehran Javon, all is fine. Despite the fact that they're down to 10 men, halftime comes up. Masoud Buruman, I mean Masoud Buruman, who we've discussed earlier, is effectively managing the team. He goes to the locker room to get him ready for the second half. He comes back. It's said that the Shaheen management team were not allowed in the special area of the stands reserved for dignitaries. So they're sitting just a couple of rows below the dignitaries. Uh, amongst the dignitaries, as I mentioned, is uh, Hussein Surudi, who's the Federation, uh, Iranian Football Federation president at the time. A man by the name of Yamin, who is head of the club committee of the federation. And Buruman comes out uh, and takes his place next to Khajanuri, 
a couple of rows below the uh, VIP section and gives Khajanuri a piece of paper and an envelope. Khajanuri opens the envelope and sees that there's a, a statement indicating that one of the Tehran Javon players, Tayyibi, I remember now, Tayyibi, should not be playing. He was disqualified because he had gotten two yellow cards or a red card, or there was some kind of sporting disqualification involved, and yet he had started the match. So this was a way of saying, look, if we end up losing this match, uh, we need to protest Taibi's presence and have them disqualified and win the match on forfeit. Khajinuri goes up a couple of uh, rows, and apparently his young son was there as well, though he didn't go up the steps with his father, and finds Surudi and gives him the letter. Long story short, Surudi is upset about the letter and says, you're going to have to show this to Yamin, who's in charge of the football committee, uh, the club committees. They go up to Yamin, and while all this is happening, all of a sudden, Chayin scores a goal. So now they're equalized, 1-1. According to Haji Nuri's uh, own recollections, and as he states in his letter to Khosravani, that really triggers Surudi and Yamin. Surudi gets in his face, apparently a few minutes prior to that, Khajanuri had noticed that Surudi was having a um, back and forth with a respect, respectable lady who was sitting in the VIP section, and the, and the lady was quoting to Surudi the famous two-line poem that was part of the foundation of Shaheen, and I'll mention that later. So it was basically an affront and an insult to Khosravani, and when the goal is scored, that just enrages him, and next thing you know, he's attacking physically Khajanuri. And Yamin apparently joins in the fracas, and everybody else is sitting there not involved. And if it wasn't for three or four military officers who happen to be sitting there, who become involved and intervene, Yami, um, I'm sorry, Khajanuri states that he was being beaten savagely in front of his son. And uh, one of the officers takes Khajanuri out of the stadium for his own safety and security. And as they're leaving the stadium, the fans roar, and the second goal has been scored now, and things are just falling apart for <laughs> Tehran Javon, and as this particular officer who's named in the letter finds a military jeep to escort Khajanuri and his son home, a third goal is scored. So Tehran Javon loses the match 3-1. Shaheen is now in a position to win the title with a couple of matches uh, left. And next thing we know, that weekend, this match took place on a Friday as usual. Uh, that weekend, Saturday, committee is formed. Uh, Surudi is enraged. He finally managed to get the attention of uh, Mohammed Khatami, known as Mohammed Khatam, who was uh, commander of the Iranian Imperial Air Force. Gets him involved. A message gets to the Shah that we need to disband Shaheen because Surudi is saying that Khajanuri has been uh, calling the Shah and the government vile names, and he was the cause of the whole commotion in the stadium, when in fact it was the other way around. And with the, the head of the Iranian Physical uh, Education Organization at the time, Baragozlu, they all agreed to sign off on a uh, declaration banning Shaheen or disbanding Shaheen. So Shaheen is kicked out of the uh, league, is no longer uh, allowed to be a club, and it's kind of a tragic, sad end fully, fully politically motivated based on not only the reputation that they had garnered, but also uh, the fact that they were likely going to be the champions of the season that year. Very political. And I think, uh, you know, any objective person reading the letter from Khosravani to Khajanuri and the response from Khosravani to Khosravani will come to the same conclusion. What was the status of Paris police at this point? So before I mention the status of press release, we have to mention that Khosravani, the recipient of uh, the response, was at the time still the chairman of Taj. Taj was not necessarily involved in this particular incident that I just recounted. Khajanuri does mention in his letter, as an aside, that his inaction, even though he may personally not have been complicit, is a reflection that Taj would also benefit from Shaheen's disbandment. And interestingly enough, the following year when Daroi actually wins the title, Khosravani is now head of the 
Iranian physical education organization, and he takes it upon himself to disband Darai and Tehran Javan. So this is the apex of political machinations in the administrative matters of the Federation and football in Tehran. And it's a, really a couple of very sour years. And in the middle of all this, Paris Police, founded by Ali Abdul, a few years earlier, actually, after he returns from the United States, uh, studying in the United States, receives approval of their application to form a fo uh, to enter their football club in what would be considered the second division of Iranian football. But before they really have a chance to start competing with the disbandment of Shaheen, the manager of Paris Police at the time, recently hired, was Parviz Dehtari, not coincidentally a Shaheen, a lifetime Shaheen supporter, and more importantly, a legendary Shaheen captain and player. Uh, and Dehtari convinces the best players of uh, Shaheen to not accept offers from other clubs who are actually all after them. Paj was after them, Pos was after them, everybody was after them because they had such uh, so many great stars and convinces pretty much everyone to join Paris Police. What happens further complicates everything because then all of a sudden, Sayomi, who was head of the Iran National Auto Company, which was at that time uh, assembling and building cars, um, decides that he's going to get involved. Uh, he's interested in football and he forms the club Haycon, which is actually the name of the primary vehicle that was being manufactured at the time. Uh, it means Arrow. And buys the license of Paris Police from Abdul. And effectively, then all those players who were playing for Paris Police or were about to play for Paris Police join Paycon. So really, Shaheen effectively becomes Paris Police by virtue of almost all of their players joining Paris Police, who then immediately join Paycon because it's just recently been formed in it as solid financial backing, obviously, because it's the second, I think, largest industry in Iran after the oil industry. And um, that's how really the transition takes place. Paycon ends up actually playing only for, actually exists only for about 15 months, just enough to win the next Tehran Club Championship. And then they disband and Paris Police takes back the players. Uh, by then they've just won the second division. So they're now part of the top echelon of Tehran Club football. And all those players who have always been associated with Shaheen end up being Paris Police Red. And really that's how in a very tumultuous two or three year period, I would say 66 through six, well, 67 through 69, so much happens. There's so much upheaval, but as a result of all this, the real Taj Paris Police rivalry is born. Who were the players that joined Paris Police from Shaheen? So my recollection is collect uh, Jafar Kashani. I know because I, as I mentioned, I knew him well. Uh, he married um, the daughter of one of the embassy employees in Kabul where my father was ambassador. So that was how I, I got to meet uh, Jafar Kashani. Again, as I mentioned, just a wonderful man. True gentleman. So Kashani was there. Oshtiani was there. Aziz Asli was there, the firebrand goalkeeper, who I think has the record of being sent off twice in the derby matches, and both times for slapping the referee, which I think doesn't happen very often in football. He was known as an excellent goalkeeper and just someone who couldn't control his uh, temper. But we loved him, actually, all of us. Didn't matter which side you were. You know, He was a national team goalkeeper, too, that won the first uh, Iranian. Well, it was the 1968 Asian Cup winner. Bezadi and Kalani, the two forwards, joined. By then, Shirzadigan had pretty much given up on football because he was pursuing his profession. Let's see who else was. Mehrab Sharokhi. Who else? Uh, Jossamian. Hamid Jossamian. Yes, Hamid Jossamian. He's also a national team player. Thank you for mentioning him. Yeah. Um, anytime I neglect to mention someone, it's not because I don't think they were important. It's just that uh, my memory my memory is not what it used to be. But it really, I would say the core, not only the core of the team, but 90% yeah. of the players that comprised the first team ended up in Pekon and then Paris Police. Yeah, others and to mention, I would say like Reza Vatanha. Oh, the Vatanha brothers, of course. Yeah. 
نازم گاجانپور Uh, Nazim Ganjapur was an important one too because he actually, I think, scored the first official first body goal against Taj in, in an official capacity or in an official match. Yeah. But Tanhal brothers are important because both Reza and Buyuk uh, ended up having a managerial role, especially Buyuk with Persepolis later on as well. Very successful. And Kazem Rahimi, did we mention him? Yes, Kazem Rahimi was also a, an important player. I, I don't think... I. You know, in in football across the world, when you're selected for t uh, for your national team, in this case, Team Meli, it always takes you up one notch. So Rahimi wasn't ever really, he, he was invited to a couple of uh, Team Meli camps, but he never actually won a cap. So that's my excuse for not mentioning him. But yes, of course, he should be mentioned. Now, describe this transition of the Shaheen players into Paris Police and the time for the, uh, the time for the team uh, this new Paris police side to be competitive and rise up the so really, divisions. So yes, effectively Abdo, who really looking back was a was a excellent manager. Uh, it, he, he proved himself as a slash owner manager. Um, again, well educated, went to the states. He actually uh, was a boxing champion, a Iranian boxing champion. Actually, his presence and his role as the founder and really the all being an all-managing person behind Paris Police's uh, founding and rise and, and uh, reaching the highest levels is interesting because it does fly in the face of those Iranians who believe in conspiracies and think that Paris Police was founded by a person who didn't have government credentials, so to speak. And so it added to the whole in my opinion, myth that Paris Police was the people's team and anti-government. Because Abdo was actually uh, the son of a very well-known uh, clergyman, uh, Buru Jerdi, who was highly respected uh, during the Reza Shah period as a jurist. His brother ended up being Iranian ambassador to India and Italy and the United Nations. So <laughs> he was an anti-government in any form or fashion. But I think he took advantage of the popularity of the team, which... I think it was primarily due to the fact that Shaheen's fan base pretty much came over to Paris Police as a result of the player movements. It's interesting too, Shaheen. We see the young generation now worldwide that they seem to follow players as opposed to clubs. But of course, back then, clubs were paramount. Uh, you never abandoned your club, and it didn't matter if your favorite player left your club and went to the you know arch enemy. But this whole transition from the disbandment of Shaheen and the need for the players to find another club and the way they transitioned to Paris Police and then right away to Pekan and then back to Paris Police when Pekan voluntarily dissolved. It's almost as if Kayomi had a plan in place to be the conduit and then step aside, allowing for Paris Police really to take the mantle that he either didn't have the passion, energy, or interest in pursuing but he did come to the rescue, effectively, of Shaheen. The name changed, of course. And by the way, the name changed to Shahbaz. So the club disbanded as Shaheen, but a new certificate and license was issued under the name of Shahbaz. And that was done actually by Padiz Khosravani the following year. So Khosravani actually should be credited with trying to revive Shaheen, but didn't maybe use all of his available resources and his pull with the authorities to rename it, to, to uh, go back and revert to the original name Shaheen, because perhaps of all the associations that we've talked about, or negative associations as far as the government would be concerned. And so he issued a license and a team named Shahbaz, which actually means Falcon, uh, was formed. Very interestingly, of course, they played in the lower divisions in 76, I believe, they won the second division and were promoted to what then became the Tahti Jamshid League. So about 10 years to the day after the disbandment of Shaheen, the phoenix that rose from those ashes, named Shahbaz, effectively raided some of the best players from Taj and finished third in the Tahti Jamshid League and may have who knows, eventually won the league had it not been for the revolution 
uh, ending football as a as a industry basically uh, for a couple of years. Yes, I was going to say Abdo basically inherited the players from Shaheen. The fans who supported Shaheen therefore immediately switched their allegiance to press police. And the myth of we're the people's team and we're anti government continued and grew, despite the fact that, as I mentioned, Abdul was anything but anti government. Um, he had uh, almost as much pull, if not more, than Khosravani did as uh, the chairman of Taj. But how many years did it take for the lower divisions to get to the top division with these new players for Paris Police? Well, actually, the, the same year. So that's why it's interesting, because when Paris Police enters the fray, it's not in the top division, or it's not part of the Tehran Club Championship. And that's why PECOM is formed. Well, I'm not saying that's why PECOM is formed, but PECOM is then formed and is given permission to become a club and buys pays cash or, you know, maybe it was a check, who knows, to purchase the license of Paris Police. And because Paris Police, in the year that it formed, won the second division, immediately those players were able to transition to PECON and play in the first division. They would have been playing for Paris Police in the first division, but Paris Police was in the process of winning the second tier. And so they would have had to play for several months or half a year in the second tier, whereas this way, their transition was facilitated uh, more quickly, and they were able to uh, take advantage of the financial resources and the opportunity that Sayomi provided by starting PayCon. So now let's get to the Taj and Paris Police initial contacts. Incidentally, as you mentioned, the first two matches between these teams were friendlies. The first one was a scoreless tie on April 5, 1960, 1968 at Amjadir. And right. we have to mention some of the players of Taj at this point. You have Ali Jabari, Ali Mohammed Kardan, Oni Karapetyan, Kambize Jamali, and Perspol is you mentioned some of their stars before. The captain was Homayun Behsadina, Jafar Karshani, Kalani, amongst others. What was the significance of this first match? You know, it's interesting because I was actually in Tehran. I was 12 years old. Actually, had I had turned 12 yet. I might have been 11 years old. And for me, as an 11-year-old, even though I was playing football on the streets on a daily basis, even if there was a school in session, and followed the football scene, it didn't really have any significance for me in the sense that it was just two clubs playing. My club happened to be Taj, so because Taj was playing, I was interested in following them. And I don't recall, I don't, I'm not sure if the full match was actually televised live. I think there may have been highlights, which I recall seeing not on the same day, but days later, perhaps, by chance. So it wasn't a major event from my perspective. But again, I was 11 years old. And so I wasn't part of that passionate fan base that would have been in the stadium. Um, and by the way, Sean, I think it's important to note that most of us, most of the people I knew, most of the kids I knew weren't allowed to go near the stadium. If my father found out that I was even remotely thinking about going to the stadium, that would be the end the end of my uh, football following days because he would have taken uh, serious action and made sure that I never got close to uh, a football stadium or a football magazine or anything uh, of the sort. So we knew that the stadium was out of bounds for us. And so our base, best vehicle really was the radio. I do remember, though, watching Pei Khan play in that first season. And I think that would be considered. See, this is the interesting part. 1968, when you mentioned is the first uh, friendly, so to speak, was also the year that we had really two championships. So we, for the first time, the Federation decided to have a, a group stage slash knockout phase championship to determine not only the national champion, but also, and that involved 58 clubs, if I'm not mistaken, you know, first division clubs, second division clubs, recently formed clubs, 
clubs that your friends may have just gathered and put, you know, a license into uh, application and gotten approved. Pretty much any football club anywhere in the country that existed was uh, allowed to participate. And the winner of that championship was going to be selected as the team to represent Iran in the Asian Champions League, uh, or what, what is now the Asian Champions League. So it was the Asian Club Cup Championship. At the same time that season, there was a five-team competition for the top Tehran clubs that took place. Taj wins that 58-team marathon. Paris Police effectively wins the five-team club championship. So really, there are two champions that year, and it depends on how you want to uh, assess the value of which competition was really more important. It's a very odd year in terms of the Iranian football calendar, historically speaking. And so the nil-nil that you mentioned, which is a friendly, if we put that aside, I believe the next match takes place within a couple of months. And that one starts becoming uh, more interesting to someone like me. And I remember playing football in the hallway of a friend's house with three or four friends using a tennis ball while we had a radio sitting on the ledge of the window broadcasting that match. So I remember the second match from memory in the sense that it was being broadcast. And I, I, I'm not sure who the broadcaster was. I'd like to say that it was Atel Behmanish, but I'm not sure it was. So I don't want to make that statement. But Behmanish's voice still resonates in my mind. I think he had the most... Um, he was by far, in my opinion, the best announcer of sporting events that we probably have ever had. People talk about Ferdowsi Pur and Jawad Khil, I mean, these people, and I don't think they even can hold a candle to Atal Behmanish. But, you know, being able to broadcast a, a football match on radio takes special skill. You have to have a greater vocabulary and the ability to relay what's happening on the pitch to people who cannot follow visually. So... In any event, I remember uh, listening to that match, and I don't recall feeling that this was very any more important a match for my club, Taj, than any other match would be. So really, in 1968, I have recollections, but none of those recollections bring back any sense of, oh, this is a new rivalry. Uh, I mean, how could it be? It was pretty much new in that sense. Or that it was really a... a the spirit of Shaheen uh, clothed in Pekan uniform. Uh, perhaps I was too young to really have understood all that was that, that had happened. And in fact, I was. So from my own personal recollection, no, I don't think there was any. But I can tell you the stadium was full. We, we knew several people who had tried to get in and couldn't. And, and they I remember saying that there were almost as many people outside the stadium, uh, Amjadiyah, than there were in. And fights broke out because people were desperate to go and see the match. So... Obviously, it was a big event. I just don't happen to have any recollection as to the importance of this perhaps groundbreaking breaking rivalry uh, taking place. Yes. In fact, the second match also in 1968, in August 1968, that ended as a 1-1 one -one tie. It's not even listed in some official records. Instead, in most records, the second match that's listed is what you mentioned, part of the Asian Champions Cup qualification process. 3-1 you're talking about? No, no, no. This is another scoreless match on January 10, 1969. Okay, so this is where, if I may, Sean, uh, I apologize for interrupting you. Yeah. That scoreless tie you're referring to, I believe, is the result from the five-club Tehran Championship that was in a form, a continuation of the prior year's Tehran Championships, which were played in the same calendar year as the Asian Club qualification, with the caveat that Paris Police having won that five match, or I'm sorry, five team uh, championship was also allowed into the Asian Champions Cup. So the 0 0, in my opinion, the first 0, zero that's considered an official match uh, goes back to that, whereas the 3-1, which is the fourth match, am I correct? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's as a result of the 58-team Wild Wild West tournament 
The teams were broken down into a number of preliminary groups. The winners of each group then got to the quarterfinals. I think there were eight, obviously, eight groups. The eight winners went into the quarterfinals, and Taj and Paris Police were drawn against each other in the quarterfinals. And I'm happy to report that uh, Taj came up victorious. So in a sense, I think those two matches, even though chronologically, yes, the nil-nil is first, the 3-1 is second, both of those really should be considered the first real formal occasions where the two teams met and the rivalry began. The first two, the, the two draws, the two uh, ties, yes, they're in the record books, but again, as I mentioned, record-keeping and the, the art and science of uh, record-keeping and statistical uh, documentation uh, was not in very good shape back then, or even now, I think. So what was the reference point when this new Taj Perspolis rivalry took hold culturally? I, I still think that we have to look at Paris Police with, with, with the understanding that there was a Pecan avatar that, uh, that was used as a transitional uh, uh, vehicle. Paris Police, the red and whites, were really the continuation of Shaheen. And so I don't really think there should be considered a break in the rivalry. I think the rivalry does go back to the 1940s, to the first, the formation of Shaheen, which I think was uh, a year before Dochaches Avaran, and then Dochaches Avaran, which became Taj. And for the next 25 years, you had the Shaheen Taj rivalry, which was maybe not as pronounced because there were other clubs that were effective and successful as well. But it's the 1960s, the political, social appeals, upheavals, the decade where really around the world things were changing, uh, where uh, Shaheen, with its emphasis on education and character building, is now also then being associated with university-based movements that are anti-government. And then Taj, of course, by virtue of the name and the way it was founded, and uh, the people who associated themselves with the club becoming uh, viewed as the, uh, the club of the government, of the monarchy. I mean, I was too young to really have an understanding of what it means, but I just like Taj. I like Taj because I liked the, the emblem, the crest. It didn't mean I was politically, actually, I was politically neutral, effectively, because I was too young to really have very formative ideas. But, you know, once it's in your blood, once you're exposed, that becomes your club. So I think the rivalry really started in the 40s, but it didn't really become intense and it didn't become the Derby, so to speak, didn't become a Derby until the late 60s. Because as I mentioned, you know, it's it's like London. You have Arsenal v. Chelsea, you have Tottenham versus Arsenal. So which one is more of a rivalry? Well, of course, Tottenham and Arsenal, both North London. Uh, but in Tehran, it wasn't geographic. It really was political and social and cultural. And there was never any doubt that the Paris Police Pass rivalry or the Taj Pass rivalry or the Taj Orab rivalry or any of the other uh, teams was ever going to amount to anything remotely as intense as Paris Police Taj because of the preceding Shaheen Taj rivalry and, and before that Shaheen Dochaka Sawari. The way the clubs were formed, the philosophies of the respective clubs, and just the ev evolutionary patterns that they end up, ended up happening to pursue, uh, intentionally or not, just made the ground fertile for what really became in the 70s war on the sporting field. We mentioned that Taj had more or less the support of the military class because of the name and the origins, etc. But what were the demographics, let's say, of the average Paris police fan and even the non-military class Taj fan? Well, I'd like to start with the non-military class Taj fan, because I think the military just represents a, a section, maybe a small section. Uh, of course, the Iranian military was growing in terms of numbers, in terms of sophistication, in terms of prominence as part of society, but it was still just a small sector of society. I think the non-military elements were pretty diverse in terms of social and standing and, and, and political viewpoints. You know, when you look at the players, the great players of Taj in the late 50s and 60s, you have uh, Buka Jedikar, Arif Ghulizadeh, 
پرویز کوزکانانی محمود بیاتی محمد رنجبر I mean I can remember Tajik players more readily because again it was my team but many of the Armenian players for example in the late 40s 50s and 60s before Ararat really became a top division club uh, played for Taj so I think Taj also was the team of the minority so to speak uh, whether it was religious or ethnic minorities it was the team where opportunities were provided to players who didn't necessarily have a direct connection to the majority elements and we have to remember Iran has always been or at least for the past 1400 years uh, an Islamic society in the sense that you know the majority of Iranians were Muslims and uh, had faith in, in in religion things of that sort so if you were an Armenian if you were Jewish if you were Kurdish and identified as Kurdish equally uh, as Iranian the tendency was that you were going to find yourself somehow associated with Taj as opposed to Paris police it was just a different viewpoint different philosophy and Taj was also more successful at branching out into the provinces so when you look at Shaheen branching out you had a Shaheen in Esfahan you had a Shaheen in Boucher but there weren't that many Shaheen clubs by the way Sepahan uh modern day Sepahan of Esfahan which is one of the top clubs in Iran was originally Shaheen Esfahan Taj meanwhile is opening branches everywhere and again of course they had the backing of the government they had more connections and it was easier for them to have doors open for them but really when you go to Taj Ahvaz Taj Abadan when you go to Taj almost anywhere you're finding clubs that are very competitive in their provincial leagues and uh, forming a great feeder to the actual Tehran Taj club so a lot of Taj's great players in the 70s especially came from feeder clubs like uh Khuzestan Taj clubs or the Mashhad uh, element or in Tabriz or wherever the uh, the case may be so I think that that's something whereas Persepolis I think if you look at players born and raised in Tehran who represented Persepolis and Taj in the 70s you'd find that their Persepolis had more Tehran based players than Taj did so Taj was I think more diverse both in terms of demographics but also in terms of geography had uh, the ability to scout and uh, bring in players from the provincial clubs that were affiliated with it I don't think Persepolis had the same network in place um, but again by virtue of being so popular among the masses if you were a young player in Zahedan uh, and you happen to support Paris police then you wouldn't necessarily need to gravitate towards a Taj uh, local Taj club you'd go straight into the Paris police uh, setup so that's how I view it whereas with Paris police as I mentioned that tradition of you know education being the foundational block and everything else follows from that did really appeal to people and as the Iranian population became better educated in the 40s and 50s and 60s they really ended up having the larger fan base I would always say whenever I went to well actually I did sneak into Amjadia once but uh, uh I can reveal that now since my parents are no longer alive um but I was mostly a uh, RMS stadium um uh, spectator so I went to a lot of uh, matches there and I saw two or three derbies there live I would say in our year we were 50 50 but if you looked outside the stadium and not counting the people who were, were hanging off the pylons and and climbing up the uh, concrete uh, uh, walls of the stadium two-thirds of the people waiting to get in were Paris police fans so I think more Paris police fans existed and were attracted to the matches and would go to the stadium but I think the authorities were able to find a way to keep the in-stadium population at a 50-50 balance. I'll tell you that in the VIP section, there was more of us blue than red. If that is not revealing of the di- political cultural divide, then uh, nothing else is. Now, do you think the rivalry intensified because of the political shenanigans behind the scenes that led to the disbandment of Shaheen in the first place? 
I think so. I think there's no way to uh, avoid looking at it that way. I remember I'm a Manchester United fan. And I'm always reminded when I go to Manchester to to follow my club by the residents of Manchester that I happen to be an outlier because the vast majority of people who reside in proper Manchester are city fans, not because of city's recent successes, but just historically. And whereas Manchester United fans are mostly from the greater metropolitan area, Salford, you know, Barrie and other places. And of course, the rest of England and the UK, Ireland <laughs> specifically is a huge hotbed of United support, but also the rest of the world. So yes, Manchester United is a much larger club than Manchester City will ever be, if I may say so on this podcast. But in Manchester proper, it's city that rules the day in terms of demographic support. In the same form or fashion in Iran, Shaheen really became uh, the number one club in terms of fan support for a number of reasons, most of which I think we've covered. Taj was always second in terms of raw numbers. I think after the Islamic Revolution, that gap intensified because how the rivalry developed and how the chasm, uh, political and cultural and social chasm, widened as we got into the 60s and then 70s. I, th I think the only rivalries that you can compare in terms of scope and non-sporting facets in world football would be uh, Celtic and Rangers in Scotland, maybe Barcelona, Real Madrid. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the importance of the rivalries are the same because obviously Spanish football and Scottish football is light years ahead of Iranian football, but many of the same or similar elements are at play in those rivalries. So I wouldn't say the Milan Derby is anywhere near because it's, you know, that's more like the Manchester Derby, you know. People are having to live in the same city and you're going to have supporters of Milan or Inter in the same family and the same uh, happens in Manchester or, or in Liverpool with Everton and Liverpool. But Barcelona, Real Madrid and uh, Celtic and Rangers are the only other rivalries that come to my mind. Nothing remotely comparable in African football. North America, it's still young and raw. So in closing, what do you think is the reason that these two teams capture the psyche of the people where you're either one or the other to this day? That's a good question, uh, Sean, because the rivalry has endured, obviously. There have been transformations. There have been periods of ebb and flow for both clubs, really. But I think it's the result of the history and the fact that the rivalry, going back again to the 1940s with Dushakhe Sabaran and Shaheen, is now pretty much in its fourth or fifth generation. And just like if you're born in a Liverpool household, you're going to probably be red. And if you're born in an Everton household, you're going to be blue. The same sense of identity and association is being passed on in Iran. And I actually know family members of friends, not my own family, who continue the support of either red or blue uh, over the course of the past three or four generations. And because now you have much more history involved uh, on the sporting field, especially, um, there's so much more to chat about and chatter about. You know, you have the, uh, when, when I mentioned statistically, Iranian football has always been uh, behind most other national federations. You know, I think when it comes to the derby matches, the stats are pretty accurate and the matches are researched in depth. Articles are written about them from the diaspora as well as from inside Iran. You have uh, documentaries. You have icons on, on either side of the divide that um, by their own name and legendary status will define who you're going to support. Even if you are born on the red side or the blue side, you may end up switching because you learn about, say, Nasser Hejazi. And if you learn about Nasser Hejazi, his life, his career, you got to be blue. doesn't matter if the rest of your family is red. I'm um, using that example. Or conversely, Ali Parveen. You have players like, to me, still the the, the greatest single uh, icon in Iranian football history on the pitch is is Parviz Khalishani. 
he happened to be one of those rare breeds who, who played for Taj, who played for Paris Police, who played for Aurab. Uh, so no one associates him with the red or blue side of the divide. But you've got Ali Parveen, always red, Marcella Jersey, always blue. And I'm using those two as examples, not, not for any specific nefarious purpose, but I'm always going to be Nasir Ejazi, even if I happen to have been uh, raised as a Paris Police fan because of what he represented and his character. And I'm always, even though I think Ali Parveen is definitely one of the five greatest, it's beginning to be hard to really um, rank players, but he's got to be in the top five, I think all time and i respect him as a player and certainly whenever he represented the national team and the goal he scored against kuwait in the 76 final is one of my favorite moments of all time and i was there in person but he's just not my type he's not who i i'm an eric Cantona person so you know i don't know if that translates into into uh iranian soccer but not say that is my man yeah and i remember just I'd hear his name when I was 10, 11, 12, and I would just uh, get goosebumps, even though I didn't really understand who he was, what kind of personality he was. And it was later on that he really showed his character and his willingness to stand up for his beliefs um, against tyranny, against corruption, against all of the other things that we've come to know now, part and parcel of Iranian football, sadly. So I think, you know, 80 years of history in terms of on, on the on the pitch results and, and competition, off the pitch views, values, and beliefs. All of these things uh, spawn legends and and create a narrative that it's just going to grab you. And that's why I think, you know, teams like Traktor Sazi of Tabriz or Sepahan of Isfahan and, and others have never managed to get the traction and no matter what is done to to berate and beat up Estelal, they're just not going to die because even if it's just 40% of the population, that's what, 35 million people. And those 35 million people will pass down those blue jeans to their next, and I don't mean blue jeans in terms of clothing, of course, attire. They're going to pass those blue jeans down to the next generation. And, you know, just like we all are hooked on football as a sport, it just becomes part of your DNA. I still have, and I, I'm sad not to be able to show it to you right now on this podcast, but I have a uh, poster, actually a photograph that I had enlarged and framed in my basement where my soccer memorabilia is, is uh, on display of the Taj team in 1974. I think it was May 3rd, could have been May 4th, that defeated uh, Paris Police in... Uh, Aryamer Stadium, I was there, it was actually the last time I saw the, the teams play against each other live. Uh, we won, courtesy of Hassan Roshan, brilliant goal, 88th minute. Every time I go in the basement, I take a look at it, and it's like, yeah, that's my team. It has no resemblance to the current Estelal version, but I'm still blue. And my son, by the way, who grew up red, even though he wasn't a big soccer fan, he wasn't actually even a soccer fan, but most of his family in Iran were were red and his grandmother who lives here is red and his grandfather is red and his mother is red over the years under my tutelage is no longer red he may not be true blue but he's leaning blue so hopefully many years from now long after I've gone he will have transitioned into a full blue supporter with that I would like to thank you for this interview. And uh, I would urge everyone to read the main blog article as well for more detail. The link is included in the video upload description along with our respective contact information. Jamshid, thank you yeah. once more. And I hope to continue these discussions on Iran football history. I appreciate that, Shani. Thank you for having me on. And it was a pleasure to be able to uh, take a trip down memory lane and uh, recall some of the formative moments of my own life as well. Thank you. All the best. Take care.